Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's house this morning. I'm Harold Winter, the pastor here in Fredericton Christian Reformed Church, and we're really delighted that you're here with us worshiping, and we're glad that we can sing praises to God and to meditate on his word. We talked in the uh, council room for a minute beforehand that uh, the beheading of John might not be appropriate for Valentine's Day per se, but uh, it is the passage that we're looking at as we work our way through the gospel according to Mark. Sorry about that. (laughs) We're going to begin our worship service, or continue our worship service, by singing uh, Christ, the life of all the living, number 137 in the Red Hymn Book. As you can see also from that song, we are in the season of Lent. The Sundays are many Easter's all through the year, and yet the season is Lent as we move towards the celebration of Jesus' resurrection. We consider the cost for our salvation. But we're also gathered, as I said, to praise God. And so hear this call to worship from, Isaiah, from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the numbers of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. Let's come close to God in a prayer that we'll silently bring to Him, asking that we can focus on hearing His voice through all that's said and done in this service. We'll conclude our prayer by singing, Hear our prayer, O Lord.
people loved by God, from where does our help come? The Lord be with you. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, from Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The river is here is our next song. There's three things that we need to know for our salvation. We need to know how great our sin and misery are. We need to know the redemption from that sin and misery. And we need to know how God calls us to His service. We find all three of those things in Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air the Spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So let's come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we hear this word of how we deserve wrath, and it doesn't feel completely comfortable it's a hard thing to wear, a hard news to hear. And so we pray that as we are involved in things that we shouldn't be, as our hearts are given in places where they shouldn't, as we have something in the throne of our life that isn't you, we confess it and ask for forgiveness. And we dare to do that through Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And we're really thankful that the gospel doesn't end there, but continues with words of life. Amen. Those words of life continue on. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgression, it is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, 
And it's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You hear that gospel there? That is by grace that you have been set free from your sin and given life and given a job to do within the kingdom. That God has prepared works in advance for us to do. Let's come to him again. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the word of life we have found in your gospel. We're so thankful for Jesus' death and resurrection. And we pray that through this service and through our conversation together, you can mold us and shape us to be people after your own heart that we can understand your call to service and we can do it wholeheartedly and faithfully. So in love to you and love to our neighbors. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to respond by singing, Blessed Be Your Name. Um, 
This, will, this is what we hope will be the first of uh, six musings about discipleship in the workplace uh, by various members of our congregation. Um, what does re- discipleship look like in the workplace to an introverted accountant? I'll start with a verse that stuck out to me this past summer and has somewhat been my motto since. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you're your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect. That's quite a challenge. How can I be perfect, or at least strive to be perfect at the office? As I mentioned off the top, I tend to have somewhat of an introverted personality, and as as such, I'm not a very outspoken person. My approach to discipleship is more through example than words. So it's actually a minor miracle that I'm up here in front of you today. I believe that we are called to be invested in our jobs. Being invested as an accountant means the active pursuit of improving the reporting systems with timely recommendations that reflect the best use of limited resources, therefore being stewardly with God's creation and my small part of it. When someone sees that you are looking beyond just how a task has been done year in and year out for the better part of a decade, instead of just trying, instead of trying to see how or what it could be better, not simply working for the weekend, they notice that you might be different. When you engage a coworker, or for that matter, and just as importantly, allow them to engage you about life beyond the office, you show that you care about them and their interests. Who knows, they might not have that many people expressing that level of interest at that point. Again, maybe they notice that you're different. Some of you may not believe this, but accountants do in fact make the odd mistake with their numbers. I've made such a mistake with someone's pay, gone to him and explained where my number came from, and he agreed because, well, I'm the accountant. Upon further reflection, I realized that I was wrong and it was to the benefit of my employer and money out of his pocket. Again, they had already agreed that I was right, so they'd have been none the wiser if we had just moved on. However, I confronted that person again and highlighted my error. This person cares more about the organization, or more about people than the organization. Maybe he's different, they might think. When those same people ask you how your weekend was and you mention, oh, it was great, I did such and such on Saturday. Sunday morning, I was able to go to church and even participate in video, sound, singing, leading, teaching the children, or whatever it is that God's spiritual gift has been given to you, and also heard an inspiring message. Then, maybe they realize why you are different. The Holy Spirit might move them to ask questions of you, Or maybe he won't at that very moment, but later on they'll reflect and pursue it further. So what can be the cost of discipleship? In my experience, I guess uncertainty and uncomfortable decisions. What I mean by that is God tells us in order to enter into true discipleship, we need to be able to drop everything and follow his lead if and when he asks. While not every aspect of Chris's my decision to move to Fredericton was a pro, through prayer we concluded that God did in fact want us to give up a good job in a good work environment and move halfway across the the country for the uncertainty of a six month contract because he has something for, for us to do here, whether or not we know what that is or not. Maybe it's having an impact on someone. There are also potential financial cost of discipleship, such as not taking, paying work because of fundamentally disagreeing with how someone operates a business. Maybe someone that has too many cash jobs that they just don't want to claim tax for. What can I gain through discipleship? Being a disciple of Christ to me, as I implied earlier, is about being invested in wherever it is that God has placed us both in our tasks and with our coworkers. Fortunately, from a pers- professional perspective, things such as humility, hard work, honest dealings, desiring to improve, 
and being a positive member in the work environment translate well with what an employer would want. As people notice that you are different in the right ways, career advancement could follow. But we're reminded that's not what it's about. We may never be privy to the impact we have on someone's life, but as Galatians 6 tells us, let us not become weary of doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap the harvest if we do not give up. If enough Christian people act like Christ, we don't give non-believers the foothold to say, aha, see, you Christians are no different, that's why I don't believe. But instead, we lay the groundwork for the Holy Spirit to advance the kingdom of God. While being perfect is a lofty goal, it is what we're called to strive for as we disciple in God's creation. I believe the young ones are going to church school now. May I have your attention for two invitations. The first invitation is, uh, has to do with bloom where you are planted. Uh, that was a theme for a rally years ago. And as far as the planting is concerned, I'm now thinking of where this building is planted, where this church building and this community is, uh, is placed for now. And uh, what impact? do we make in this immediate community? In one of the reveal, uh, in one of the out, um, renewal lab books we had to read it, what the question was asked, what if this church, this building, the activities in these buildings were gone tomorrow, would it make any difference? And I think sometimes that's a really good question to ask. So, we have uh, something going here, right in our backyard, McAdam Avenue School. It is right in the backyard. The Renewal Lab Outreach and the Deacons have been uh, doing some things there, uh, mostly money, donating money from all of you for hot lunch pro programs and for uh, supplying children that cannot pay for it with milk once a day. Uh, the other one is illiteracy in this community in all over the world. The tremendous cost that it uh, gives to, it, it, the tremendous cost towards the child, towards the adult, towards society, money, you name it, is amazing if you can't read. So about four people so far have signed up to come on Wednesdays from 11 to 11.45 to go to McAdam Avenue School and read to kids, with kids, uh, uh, little assignments. It's elementary school, so it's simple. We love you for you to, uh, to join us. So what we need for that is people that love to make a difference in a child's life, people that have one hour per week to spare, and you need a copy of your criminal record background. You could do, talk to me if you're interested. Or you can go, if you don't live here and you want to go to your own neighborhood uh, school, that's a great idea too. The second one is even more exciting. Invitation to Friday night, open mic night, uh, coffee house, this Friday night at 8 o'clock here in the church. It will be a pile of fun. Pat, Amanda, and Josie, together with the rest of the YP, are organizing it. Uh, the YP are looking after the food, and I'm sure that will be awesome. There is an opportunity for us to give donations to the YP for their programs for a thank you, as a thank you for them preparing this. So what i like you to do is come, bring a neighbor, bring a friend, be prepared to welcome our neighbors that might be coming, and be prepared to have a great evening. And by the way, the next, the March fun night, family fun night, is going to be a movie night again. Sorry, 
Good morning. I have two things I want to share with you. Number one is, in all your mailboxes, you will find this blue piece of paper. That is a new suggested vision and value statement of our church. So it is a suggested one. What we like you to do is take this home, read it, think about it, wonder if that's what you believe the Lord's will is for this church. And then next week, Sunday, we're going to have, during coffee time, tables downstairs with chairs around them. And we uh, we will have cookies, that always helps. And we'll ask you to participate with us in, in discussing and in telling us what you think about what you see on this paper. Each table will have a member from the Renewal Lab or Council. I don't think they knew that yet, but now they know. Who can take notes and who will guide the discussion a little bit. So that's going to be next week, Sunday. It's in your mailbox. Please look at it. Totally different thing. So this was the one. For those of you who read the Daily Gleaner, could have read this week about an article and it said, religious leaders speak out against suicide. And it quotes especially our former governor general, I think that's his title, Graydon Nicholas. Lieutenant governor, he said. In that article, he speaks about his Christian belief, about sanctity of life, and as a First Nation man, he very clearly states what he stands for as a child of God. When we did a revealed study, I think many of us indicated that we sometimes find that difficult. We, we don't know exactly what we hear on Sunday, how to put it out in our daily lives. We're going to do something that is rather non-traditional. I am going to invite you on February 23rd at 8 o'clock at night to meet at Mama's Pub. I'm sure this is the first time in this church. It's going to be in a very relaxed atmosphere, hopefully. Mama's Pub, by the way, is across from the Brookside Mall. And the intent of that evening is that with the people there, we share, we challenge, we discuss issues of the world we live in today. And that by listening to each other and by sharing and by challenging, we have a deeper and more fully understanding of how God wants us to live in this world. February 23rd, 8 o'clock, Mama's Pub. You're very welcome and we look forward to this. We realize this is a new thing, but it's part of that of those things you identified that, that you struggle with, that we struggle with, as how to live as Christians during lunchtime. I think Ian said it very nice, by the way. How do we, when we have our cup of coffee at the corner store, when the people we travel with, how do we talk about issues? How do we show Christ in what we say? Looking forward to meeting you there. February 23rd, 8 o'clock at night.
This morning's scripture reading is found in the Gospel of Mark, the sixth chapter, verse 12 to 29, which is found on page 711 in my book. (laughs) Apparently, 996. Before we do that, shall we pray? Lord, we come to you now. Thank you so much that we could gather together in this cold weather and we can sing praises to you and now we can hear your words. So, oh Lord, we pray for your blessing upon that. Also, when the minister preaches about it, we pray for your blessing upon that too, Lord, so that we may use it in our everyday lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chapter 6, verse 12. They went out and preached that the people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. King Herod heard about this for Jesus' name. Had, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah, and still others claimed He is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man is beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he has him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to her, Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportunity, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guest. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I will give it to you. And he promised her with an oath. Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girls hurried in to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guest, He did not want to refuse her, so he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The men went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So far God's word.
dearly loved people of God, some of the events that are recorded in Scripture are really difficult to read. They're troubling and disturbing. And that's what we find here in this passage. We read how John the Baptist was doing his job, what God had called him to do, and as a direct result of doing that job, God's work, he lost his head. He lost his life. It's rather shocking here, close to the beginning of the gospel of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, how we already hear here of a casualty in this battle between God's kingdom and the kingdoms of this world. We know, that's clear in the first line already, how Jesus has won and will win this victory. We talked about that last week, that this on the first line, the whole book is called the gospel, the good news, the victory proclamation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So we know what the end is going to be, and yet here in chapter 6, we hear how one of the first people to proclaim the coming of God's kingdom was executed as a result. John's death is a blow to his disciples. John's death is a blow to his fans from every generation. And it's particularly alarming to us, I think, because we don't expect the cost of discipleship to be nearly that high. We don't expect the cost of discipleship to require us to give our lives. We don't expect anything to cost that much. Our culture kind of shields us from a lot of dangers. It shields us from a lot of risks. Safety is one of the major cultural concerns in our society. We like to be safe and keep people safe. Not all cultures are that way, though. Not all cultures have quite the same concern for safety that we do. That was clear in one of the sessions I attended this week as we prepare to welcome a refugee family, the reminder that, that these children and, and these families have not been protected from danger the same way that we have for most of their lives. And that it would be a change for them coming into our type of culture. But even in my lifetime, our culture has changed. The ideas of, of what is safe and what is risky have changed in my lifetime. You want an example? 37 years ago, 1979, I attended kindergarten. And I walked from my house, 67 Second Street North, 550 meters down the streets to Green Acres School. And I did that for at age five every day by myself. You're not that surprised and shocked that in my day and age, that was a normal thing for kids to have to go do that. Some of you walked even further, perhaps. But nowadays, if we required kids to walk that far by themselves at age five, people would be astounded and shocked and say, that's not safe. How can you do that? These poor little kids will get lost, they'll get kidnapped, all sorts of stuff will happen. We are interested in that kind of safety in our culture. I'm not wanting to start a debate about what's appropriate distances and all that kind of stuff. That's not my interest. I just want to illustrate that even in the last 37 years, the idea of what's safe is and what is not safe has kind of shifted towards being more careful and protective of our kids. So what do we do then with this gospel account? in which John gets beheaded for calling people to repent. Preaching isn't safe by this account, is it? And yet in our culture, we don't expect that kind of risk in being a Christian. We don't expect that kind of risk in discipleship. It's kind of weird for us here in North America. We don't hear of this stuff happening in and around this neighborhood. We don't expect to be beheaded for the gospel of Jesus Christ, despite things that we hear might be happening in different parts of the world. But it's a little bit beyond that even. John's call to repentance really offended some people. And we're not in call, inclined in our culture to cause that kind of offense, particularly to powerful people like Herod and Herodias. 
calling celebrities to repent of adultery, that's not just often done very well, very much around here. Calling people to repent for any kind of sexual intercourse outside of marriage between a man and a woman isn't really considered culturally appropriate. Some people find that kind of statement particularly offensive. They say what happens in somebody's bedroom between two consenting adults is nobody's business but those two people's. But that's not the assumption that John the Baptist had. That's not the assumption that John the Baptist culture had. No, John boldly speaks the truth to power. Herod should not marry Herodias. He's pretty bold about that. After all, she's already Herod's brother Philip's wife. So if he marries her, you can call it incest or you can call it adultery, but misbehavior smells bad by whatever name it goes by. And so he butts against great opposition. He has a lot of trouble. And it's kind of a hard message for us to hear and for us to give because most Christians are very careful not to give offense. We want to make it easy for people to hear the gospel of Jesus' victory. We want to faithfully reflect the ministry of Jesus as described in the gospel account that John gave when he said, God did not send his world into the world. God did, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Not condemning them, yet calling them to repentance. How do we wangle that one? And yet, this gospel, which calls people to repentance and to holiness, can cause offense. It steps on toes, it challenges people. John found out to his great pain that neither Herod nor Herodias were particularly pleased to be called to repent. They resisted his call in the strongest of terms. Did this rough preacher really think that he could get away with publicly denouncing aristocrats like them, calling them to repent? These powerful rulers flexed their muscles. John was arrested, he was bound, he was put in prison. And as offended as Herod was, he still was kind of intrigued by John's message still. Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. He acknowledged that much about John. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, and yet he kind of liked to listen to him. You see how he's caught between these two poles, that, that he has great respect for his holiness and his righteousness, and, and yet offended still that that he had to change his behavior as a result of this message that John is giving? He's waffling there between being offended and, and being intrigued by this whole message that he was bringing. Herodias, however, was much more clear than that. Her response was a lot more cut and dried. She didn't want this preacher to get in the way of her relationship with her, King Herod and all the perks that she enjoyed at his side. I've seen that kind of resistance before to a call to repentance. In fact, there's something in me that resists the call to repentance as well. I kind of like the things I'm doing, that's why I'm doing them. And the call to change, that, that feels uncomfortable. To get away from the stuff, the patterns that I'm in, that's hard to do. We are set in our ways. And there's something in us that resists the call to, to change, the, the call to be more holy. You ever identify with Herodias before? And yet in the end, her malice prevailed. In the end, Herod was trapped in his pride King Herod was trapped in the promises that he had made to Herodias' wife, and as a result, John was beheaded. John was a casualty in this conflict between the kingdom of God, which came in Christ to be victorious, and the kingdoms of this world. John paid a steep price for his willingness to answer God's call to discipleship, to answer God's call to bring this message of a kingdom that was coming and had now come. 
And yet it wasn't just John who brought this call to repentance, was it? I mean, we read in the, in the last few verses of the earlier section, and we found that jo- Jesus had sent all 12 of his disciples out to preach. They went, they went out and preached that people should repent. It was a pretty cut and dried message for them too, echoing what John had said by the Jordan River that people needed to repent. It's the same message, by the way, that the Apostle Peter gave. Remember on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit blew through the city and people gathered around in great crowds and and Peter stood up and he spoke about Jesus' victory over death and he concluded that when people said, okay, well, that's a great story. Now what should we do because of this victory? His response was what? Repent. And be baptized, every one of you. I promise that's for you and for your children and for all who are far off. And yet, we're not always really clear on how to express this call to repentance. We need to be clear, though. This is, this is important stuff. This is on behalf of the kingdom of God, which comes in all of its glory in Jesus Christ. We need to steer, steer straight so that the message can be out there and proper. And in this regard, I find Timothy Keller to be helpful. In his book, Center Church, he shows how the gospel avoids both legalism and relativism. Those are big words. What's legalism? Legalism assumes that we can impress God with how good we are. Legalism assumes that we can kind of work towards our own salvation by being good enough. And so legalism wants to call and insist, everybody, you be good like me, so that God will be impressed with us. On the other end of the spectrum, relativism assumes that behavior doesn't really matter that much. God is a God of love, and therefore our actions don't really matter so much. The more that we sin, the more God forgives. Isn't this a wonderful thing? And the gospel isn't on either side of that. The gospel avoids both ditches. The gospel reminds us that we cannot save ourselves by our own actions. The gospel reminds us that we've fallen short of God's expectation. But since God the Son has taken the punishment for our sin on Himself, has died to suffer hell in our place, because He's redeemed us from brokenness and from a sinful way of living, we now aim to avoid the kind of sin that we've been rescued from. We want to live up to God's call for holy living. You see what I'm saying here about the gospel? It avoids both challenges. I mean, I spoke recently to somebody about the challenges of Christian discipline. It's one of the marks of the church that, that we're called to, to call each other to holy living. And It's a challenging thing to do sometimes. It calls us to balance truth and love, truth and grace. And legalism makes us much more concerned for truth-telling than love. Legalism makes us willingness to burn bridges and to stomp on toes because we're right. Relativism, on the other hand, strives for love at the cost of truth. And so it kind of soft pedals sin. Well, that, that ain't so bad, really. And offers up warm fuzzies. I'm okay, you're all right, God loves us all. The gospel's not on either side. It's right in the center. Neither legalism nor relativism does justice to this gospel. And that's the message that we have received. That's the message that we're sent to bring. And so God sends his prophets like John the Baptist. He comes himself as Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. And he sends out his disciples in Mark chapter 6. And his disciples that are sitting gathered here in this sanctuary to bring this message of the gospel. The gospel is that victory proclamation that is honest about sin and yet also faithful in love. 
It's a recognition that I have fallen short of the glory of God and His call to holiness, and so have you, and yet God loves us. And in Christ has made a way for us to love Him and to love our neighbor. That Jesus has paid for humans' sin. He suffered death and hell and burial in order to bring us freedom, to give us new life in Jesus' resurrection. And that's the victory that we're called to proclaim, that we're called to invite people to respond to. And so here's the challenge in our calling. How do we in humility and boldness fulfill our calling to speak the truth in love? I know as a minister I haven't always hit that balance properly. As leaders in the church, we haven't always done that fully. We've fallen short of that mark. And I regret the unnecessary offense that's caused. Because there's a time when it sounds different, when it looks different. As a parent, there's a time when you yell across the room to your kids, Stop! Because what they're doing causes imminent danger to them or somebody else. But there's other a day when you, also a day when you saddle up to them and put your arm around them and say, Hey, sweetie, do you, do you really think that's a great idea? And yet both are a call to, to doing what's right an invitation to, to safety and, and to holiness. And getting the tone right, well, that's hard work. That's challenging stuff. Calls for discernment. Calls for being in step with the Spirit and in tune with the people around us. And so we continue to work at this together sometimes misstepping, sometimes doing it wrong, sometimes really doing it well and, and having great results. That we bring this message of Jesus' victory over sin and death and evil and we call each other away from sins that cause death, that cause destruction, that cause harm. And we do that risking that we offend people. We risk getting pushback. Sometimes we risk getting severe pushback. Why? Why do we risk that? Why are we willing to put ourselves out for that? Because Jesus has won the victory as a result of Jesus' ministry and calling people to repentance. As a result of his resurrection, the gospel brings renewal, it brings life, new life, it, it puts things back together, it brings shalom into our world. I mean, notice what happened when Jesus sent his disciples with this message. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Evidence that the kingdom of God is on the move. They preached repentance. And demons were cast out. People were freed from the power of the evil one. And sicknesses were, well, were ended. And people were restored to health again. That's that renewal, that, that rebirth, that regeneration that comes as the kingdom of God advances powerfully. That's the message that we're given. That's the reason why we call people away from stuff that's hurtful and harmful into a walk with God that brings them holiness and life and righteousness. Now, we don't always see the kingdom of God advance as powerfully as, as Mark describes here in this passage. But Jesus' victory is being felt in our community. People are growing and being restored. Broken bridges are being repaired. The victory of Jesus is being experienced and felt in our community and in our world. And true, there's pushback to this call to repentance. There's a cost to discipleship. Maybe you won't be beheaded the way John was, but but you might be injured, you might be hurt, you might get pushed back. But we run those risks for the sake of our calling. We've been given this great news, of, uh, this good news of great joy that's for all the people. And we come with a message, a message that Jesus has won the victory. A message that Jesus has set humankind free from sin and put their feet on a path that leads to righteousness. And this gospel message is so important. Our calling is so holy. The rewards of faith so enduring that it demands our faithful attempts to call people away from sin and brokenness, to call people to repentance, to call people to faith and to holiness in Christ. 
the Son of God. Amen. I love, the, love you, Lord, for you have heard my voice. Verses 1, 2, and 3. That's number 735 in the red hymnal. I got to talk to David Hood a few days after his operation, and we're really thankful to the Lord that his knee surgery went well. And it was really neat to hear him and Anne describe how his small group had given them a couple calls during the day and how other people have visited and supported them. So thank you for your loving concern showed to him. We'll continue to support them as he recuperates from his surgery. Talk to Mary Dugan as well about Tom McKay. He's receiving treatment down in Halifax for his pancreatic cancer, and we'll continue to lift them up in prayer. As people who have gone through chemo and radiation will tell you, it's making him tired and sicky feeling. There are other things that we should include in our prayer together. Yeah, Tex. Dave said he'd be home today. Yeah, that's right. David said he'd be home today. Thanks for visiting him. Terry. I spent some time at emergency yesterday with Gabby. She hmm. has uh, something on her leg. Uh, I don't know what it is yet still. But uh, she's just on medicine, uh, on new medication. But uh, we spent six hours up at uh, the Chalmers in the emergency department. And uh, there are some demons in the city. There was a lot going on there yesterday. A lot of, uh, a lot of activity. Yeah, surprising how that keeps on going hour after hour, day after day. We're not there. I remember the Sunday morning that I sat there too. And there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, Ellie. Yep. 
Absolutely. Yeah, we have a number of students in our congregation that are grade 12, grade 8, looking at next steps. And uh, beyond that as well, looking for jobs and figuring out where God's calling them. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. We also have a number of expectant mums in our congregation. We'll pray for those that are expecting. Yeah. On Valentine's Day, those that are having trouble with their live lives and uh, or lacking somebody. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. Let's come to God. Heavenly Father, we're really thankful for your call to us. And sometimes it seems really challenging of how to answer your call. I mean, we're delighted that we're made alive and given freedom in Jesus Christ and that we have hope and a future And yet knowing how to walk alongside other people, how to wrestle in our own brokenness, to give up stuff that we're attached to, and to follow your command to be perfect, to be holy. But also as we have occasion to challenge each other, to encourage each other, to ask questions of each other, of what it looks like to be a disciple of yours. We pray for much wisdom and much grace, much tact, and yet boldness at the same time, so that we can speak the truth in love, and so that that love can be felt and experienced as well as the concern for life and holiness. We don't always get this right. Not as parents, not as siblings, not as people in a church. And so we pray for forgiveness for when we've messed this up. And we pray for grace to continue walking alongside each other and to keep on working towards striking the right balance for hearing other people and for talking to other people. It's part of the challenge of walking together in this journey together. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you help us. And we can't do it alone. We're really thankful for the community that we're part of. We're thankful for the love and support that we have, that we celebrate, we celebrate each other's joys and that we walk alongside each other when life is challenging. And so we're thankful for the small group that has taken care of David and Anne as he went through his operation this week. We're really thankful that his knee repair went really well and we look forward to him coming home hopefully today and being able to walk and move much more comfortably than he had been. We pray that you watch over Tom and Mary as well as as Tom goes through the chemo and radiation treatments. We pray that that can halt the cancer and promote life and strength for him. We pray, Heavenly Father, that Gabby can get better again. It's a concern when you have something going on with your legs that doesn't feel comfortable and doesn't look right. We pray that the medication she received can be helpful for her. And yet, as Terry mentioned, it gives a window into the, op- the emergency room, seeing things and experiencing stuff that we don't see and hear every day. We recognize that there's a lot of brokenness and a lot of hurt within our communities. And we pray for those that work in that environment as healthcare professionals, that they can be your hands and your feet and your voice bringing healing and strength and encouragement and doing it in their workplace with gracefulness and promoting health and renewal. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are expecting children. Sometimes pregnancies are really long and have their own challenges, and yet we look forward to the arrival of these children among us. And so we pray for strength and that all things can go well that these little ones can arrive safely at the proper time. We pray as well, Heavenly Father, for those who have full hearts. We're thankful for the love that is enjoyed, for the strength of relationships we witness within this church family. 
And yet our hearts also break with those who are brokenhearted, where relationships are bumpy, where there's misunderstanding and disagreement and harsh words that are said. And we're mindful of those as well that, that dearly long to have somebody to hold, somebody to walk alongside them. And yet that place is empty, either because they haven't found someone or because the person that they love and held on to has passed away. Heavenly Father, it's all real complex, and there's a lot of different situations represented among the people here. And so we pray for us to have tact and sensitivity and understanding as we walk alongside each other, but also for your will to be done in our lives, for our households and for this church family to be a place where there is safety, where there is encouragement, where we can be honest about what's going on, and where we can support and encourage each other. Heavenly Father, the prospect of graduating from grade 8 or grade 12 or from college or university looks really, really good. It's a great time to celebrate that milestone. And yet there's also challenges as we try to discern what's next for us, where you're calling us, what our gifts and skills are, how best to serve in your kingdom, how best to take next steps. And so give wisdoms to students and parents and adults as we walk alongside each other, that we can make choices, that we can hear your voice and your calling, that we can encourage each other and prod each other in good directions. Not just for our own sense of fulfillment or not just to earn a living, but also that we can advance your kingdom and be representatives of yours in exactly the places where you call us to do so. So that whether we are introverted accountants or outgoing and doing something else, that we can be ambassadors of yours and disciples of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now? All right. People loved by God, lift up your hearts to receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you shalom. And all God's people say, Amen.